Welcome to another episode of Talking with Docs. I'm Dr. Paul Zalzal. I'm Dr. Brad Weening. I'm Mike Hefferton. And today we're talking about sounds. And we could have made this a podcast. Yeah. Sounds that the heart makes. Yep. And specifically, murmurs. You might know someone or you may have a heart murmur. What is the deal? What is the beat on the street with heart sounds? So what I'll tell you first though is that murmurs, it's like a 700 or 800 year old word that was like the grumbling of people talking like they're murmuring or grumbling about stuff. Not That's sure where the talking. word murmur came from. They think it's either Latin or French. They're not sure, but there you go. A little, Thanks for the demonstration. A etymology. A Thanks for the demonstration <laughs> of a murmur. There you go. I like that. Okay. So when it comes uh, to the heart though, what does it mean? So what does it mean? It's a sound. Okay. Right? So. Uh, it's not uncommon for patients in the office to say, hey, doc, you know, I've been told I've had a murmur since, you know, childhood. Right. Um, and that's actually usually the case um, because murmurs are sounds that we listen to with our stethoscope. Okay. And, um, and it's really common for kids and young individuals to have a innocent flow murmur okay. over one of the valves called the pulmonic valve. Um, kids are generally thin. It's really easy to hear, and uh, and it's absolutely normal. Yeah. So that's that's not uncommon. And then there are a variety of other murmurs, so that come up a little later in life, in middle age, and a cardiologist or your family doctor has a little listen. And it's like, oh, you know what? I hear something. Generally, shouldn't be hearing murmurs in middle-aged individuals. So that would warrant the next test, which is something called an echocardiogram, okay. which is an ultrasound of your heart, which allows us to check the structure of the heart and the valvular function. Um, we were just talking about I, I could go on forever about right. you know different kind of murmurs, different kind of valvular abnormalities, and we thought we'd focus on one, right? Right. And, and when it comes to a murmur, the reason that it makes a sound is. Paul being an engineer would love to talk all day about the fluid mechanics is about yeah. like speed, viscosity, and then the size of the hole that it's going through, right? Would yeah. you say that those three things are yes. important? Yes, yes. And specifically uh, when fluid is flowing, if it's going in a smooth sort of layered fashion, it's called laminar flow. When it gets disrupted, it's called turbulent flow and you can hear the turbulence pretty, pretty well. So part of that, what you're hearing would be just turbulent flow, which is caused by an abnormality with the valve. So the heart's got valves, right? Four valves pulmonary, tricuspid, uh, mitral aortic, and the mm -hmm. valves are important to let the blood flow in the right direction. They're one-way valves. Blood flows out, then they close so the blood doesn't go back in the heart, right? So four valves. And we're going to focus now... Let's focus on the aortic valve. The aortic valve. So that's sort of the, the last valve of the heart before the blood goes into the aorta. Uh, sort of probably sees the highest flow. Yep. And um, as that would be the most common one that can generate a murmur? In so general? probably the two most common would be aortic valve and mitral valve. Okay. Um, but I think from the audience perspective, sure. aortic valve is probably the one that people are going to be most familiar with in some terms of the treatment and some of the new options that are available. Okay. Right, but if you have a murmur somewhere else, the symptoms are, are similar in that it has a sound, but what part of your body it affects, whether it's your heart or your lungs or your periphery, that's what's gonna change a little bit and your doctor will discuss those specifics. Okay. So aortic valve problems or aortic stenosis. So a murmur yeah. caused by an aortic valve problem. So aortic valve, mm -hmm. last valve, before you leave the heart. Okay. And as you mentioned, uh, it's a one-way valve, it's a check valve. So opens, blood goes out, closes, so the blood can't go back where it was. And uh, and I like your description, Paul. So these the valves are always there to keep the blood moving forward and, and their closure, that check, Point stops it from going back from where it was. Uh, it would be useless if the blood all went out and then it just flowed yeah. right back. Um, so aortic stenosis, is an aortic valve that's narrowed. Okay. Uh, often because as time goes on, so these valves open and close 100,000 times a day. <laughs> so, and that's if your heart rate's 60 beats a minute. Right. That's 100,000 times a day. So it's a pretty amazing piece of 101,000 if you just heard that quote. Yeah. yeah. But, um, so over time, there's a little wear and tear. Uh, some people get more wear and tear than others. And the aortic valve can either get too narrowed or too leaky. Okay. So narrowed is aortic stenosis and too leaky is aortic regurgitation because the blood is going to flow back right. um, to where, from where it came from. <clears throat> so let's do aortic stenosis okay. first. Um, and so common as people get older, mm -hmm. Uh, very common cause for that murmur that we uh, we talked about, and and as time goes on, mostly people are asymptomatic. Okay. They do not know that they have aortic stenosis. Their family doctor or their cardiologist would be able to hear it very easily, um, but they're the kind of individuals that we do an echocardiogram every year, and then every six months, and we watch. 
And often we'll find that they hit to a point where we need to do something about this valve right. um, around the time when they're just starting to feel symptoms. Right. And so what percentage of people are we talking about? Like how, how common of a problem is this? So in a, you know, in a 70 or 80 year old population, probably on the order of a few percent. So three, right. three or four so percent. Not okay. uncommon. Not uncommon. No. You know? All right. Yeah. So and just like a lot of diseases that are monitored, you're monitoring until you get to a critical point where an intervention becomes necessary. Right. So with the aortic stenosis, you're doing fine, then it progresses, maybe, maybe not, but if it does progress to a point where intervention is necessary, what do those interventions look Sorry, like? Sorry, just before we get to that, yeah. if it progresses, are you seeing the progression on an echocardiogram? Are they coming in with symptoms? Like, are they gonna feel something and say, wow, doc, when I do this, now I can't anymore. So we usually, we usually see the progression on the echo before they start to feel symptoms. Right. We usually always ask them to come in with their partner, right. uh, with their spouse or, or loved ones, um, because usually the loved ones notice that they're slowing down before the patients feel it. So reduced exercise tolerance. Yeah, reduced exercise tolerance, more shortness of breath. Would you have chest pain? So you can get chest pain, but that's really when the aortic stosis is getting really critical. Okay. Um, and the worst case scenario is also blacking out. Okay. So brownouts, you know, getting to the top of the stairs and getting really lightheaded because you can't get enough blood out of that valve. Right. So I missed um, that last part. What did we say? Go ahead. <laughs> or blackouts. Wow. Yeah. And and a blackout, of course, is there simply isn't any blood coming out for a few seconds. So to your brain. Out. So your body protects you. If you can't get enough blood to your brain, your body's going to make you lay down to get blood to your brain on right. a flat surface. So those are the extreme symptoms. Okay. But usually we're catching all of this well ahead of time. Right. And when we talk about intervention, it's usually because it's balancing the risk. Okay. So we know that the risk of some intervention, let's say surgery, for instance, is maybe one or 2% sure. of not surviving the surgical procedure. Oh, wow. Yeah. So actually, and that's low for cardiovascular surgery, yeah. one right. to 2%. That's and why so, we're orthopedic surgeons. That, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Wow. So that's, that's, how, that's when we know when to send somebody. We're going to sure. balance that risk of having something bad happen in terms of waiting, one to right. 2% right. versus the risk of surgery. Right. And when the balance of waiting is riskier than going on to surgery, it's time. Right. Um, so cardiovascular surgery, this is this is a slam dunk for a cardiovascular surgeon. Okay. A fairly straightforward. Okay. To, is there uh, one operation? It's one operation okay. for this um, open heart surgery. Yep. Go in, take out the old valve, pop in a new valve, a right. pig valve, a cow valve, and those valves. You know, they do very well, probably last on the order of 15 or 20 years. Okay. Um, or a mechanical valve. We didn't mention a mechanical valve. Right. In a younger individual, we put a mechanical valve in. The only downside with a mechanical valve is you're committed to lifelong anticoagulation, which is right. warfarin. Okay. Um, so we try and avoid that if possible. Hang on, is it still just warfarin or is it only, and nothing else is indicated only yet? Only warfarin for mechanical valves. Okay. Yeah. Now, Times have changed, right. um, and particularly in patients over the age of 70, right. we don't have to do open heart surgery anymore. There's good data to show that we can, we can, we can actually squish a new valve over the old valve by just kind of going in through the leg and wow. through the catheter. And that's called, depending on where you live, it's called a TAVI or a TAVR. Okay. Uh, TAVI in Canada in the Commonwealth, TAVR in the United States. Okay. And uh, we can crush a new valve over the old valve and uh, and that works really well. And is that by the cardiac surgeon or by a cardiologist? Usually it's a team. So a team. it's okay. usually a cardiologist doing it with okay. the cardiovascular surgeon sitting back. <laughs> just saying, in case, just go in case sideways. this goes sideways. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. We're here to help. And so so that's a good question. So someone's going to say, well, how often does it go? And not sideways because someone made a mistake. Sideways because the pathology might not have been totally appropriate in the moment. Yep. So how often does that happen? One in a thousand. Okay, oh, really okay. uncommon. So yeah. You're in good shape then. Yeah. All right. So. The ne so basically, the, the intervention for aortic stenosis, there's not a medication intervention. No, it's a me so it's a mechanical problem, so it needs a, a mechanical surgical, fix. Surgical yeah. intervention is really all you're looking at for a aortic stenosis that hits a critical point that needs treatment. So, so surgical mm -hmm. or, or, or percutaneous, so yeah. going in through the leg. I and included then, that in sort of Thank surgical. you, thank yeah. you. The cardiologist would cringe at that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. 
And there's, there's actually, there's one other thing, because there may be some young individuals out there. Uh, some people are found to have aortic stenosis earlier in life, okay. because that aortic valve should have three doors, mm -hmm. okay? Um, but 2% of people in the world have two doors. Right. Mm -hmm. And the system wasn't made for so two doors. It's a bicuspid aortic valve. It's a bicuspid valve rather than a tricuspid valve. Okay. So there's more wear and tear on the two doors than the three doors. Mm -hmm. um, and so they develop problems earlier in life. Okay. And so for those, in, usually around the age of 35 or 40, you'll start picking those patients up. Um, we don't really want to put a mechanical valve into them for the rest of their lives and have them on a blood thinner. Mm -hmm. We also know if we put a pig or a cow valve in, they're going to be back and they're going to be back maybe two or three times in their lifetime. Um, and the more you go into the chest and do open heart surgery, the more difficult it is. So there's a really cool procedure called the Ross procedure um, where you can do the one open heart surgery and you can take the pulmonic valve and put it where the aortic valve is supposed to be and then you can take a cadaveric valve oh. uh, yeah and put it where the pulmonic valve is and that might be a fix for your entire life wow. um, so robbing the, Peter to pay Paul it, I don't mind that but yeah and that's it, basically it works what you're well doing. but yeah. you know that's a specialized yeah. procedure um, really gifted cardiovascular surgeons who've done a lot of this uh, should be the ones who are kind of that's undertaking the Ross that procedure. procedure. You're the not Ross dabbling procedure. in the Ross. You're not dabbling yeah. in the Ross. Mm -hmm. I feel a friends no. joke coming from Paul. No, I can feel no it. No friends joke. Oh. It's too low hanging fruit. <laughs> But I'm just saying, like that Ross really went out on a limb when he tried oh, that see. one. Nice. Right? Nice. Yeah. Okay, so I have two more questions. Okay. So I would suspect that once you got this procedure and have recovered from the surgery itself, yeah. your life change must be immediate almost. Oh, it's really good. Right. Because it's, you know, it's really nice to be able to see the patient about six weeks after surgery saying, you know, how are you feeling? And, yeah. and depending on what procedure they've had, let's yeah. say worst case scenario, they had cardiovascular surgery, they're a little sore, sure. but they feel remarkably better. Right. Yeah. And then second question, because some people are going to ask this, is there anything that led to this other than their genetics and time and aging, like modifiable stuff beforehand? So what you ate, if you exercise, if you smoke, like are there things that you should stop? If you say, hey, I, I don't care about my whole life, I just don't want aortic stenosis, right. what are the things that could increase the chances that they don't get it, but not eliminate it? Are you allowed to fib on this? Sure. So don't smoke. Right. Smoking is a leading cause of aortic stenosis. So no. unfortunately, <laughs> he's gonna say that it doesn't matter, and that's too bad. It doesn't but matter. There's, there's lots definitely. of other reasons to not smoke. There are no lifestyle. Okay, so you, they looked at everybody and they didn't say, well, this person ate a lot of potato chips, or this right. person didn't exercise, it's just the way that it is. Yeah. Okay, that's what you're going to be proud of. If you have a very poor lifestyle, your risk is not higher of aortic stenosis. Yeah. There you go. We didn't talk about aortic regurgitation. I would so love just, to. A, just a quick thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so less common. It's a leaky valve. Right. Um, much better tolerated okay. over time than the narrowed valve. Um, but very similar procedures uh, in terms of being able to do a Ross procedure in one situation, cardiovascular surgery. In general, we don't do the TAVIs or TAVERS for leaky aortic valves. Okay. Just less tried and true for that. Okay. And if you're wondering why with a mechanical valve you need blood thinners, it's because the mechanical valve is a foreign body that's in there and that could trigger the clotting cascade in your blood and lead to clots and things that could end up giving you a stroke or something like that. Right. And you uh, were getting at, you know, are any of the new blood thinners, you know, can you use it for mechanical yeah. valves? And, and it was tried and, 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 uh, and didn't work. Okay. All right. So those are the newer, like a Xarelto or a Rivaroxaban or a yeah. Pradax or something like that. You're stuck with warfarin. The bummer about warfarin is you have to get your blood tested on a regular basis to yeah. see how it's affecting you because warfarin affects everybody differently. Okay. I feel way better educated about murmurs and about the aortic valve. If you guys like this, please like it, subscribe to our channel, talk to your doctor if you have any of these symptoms that we're talking about. Dr. Hoffman, thank you very much. Thanks oh, for having me, guys. Yeah. Wonderful awesome. ride on the heart valve education train. Choo choo. You are in charge of your own health. We'll see you next time.